Does anyone else have any announcements that they need uh, that they want to bring up at this point? Okay, I was told you have to give it a count of 15 with with the video meeting so people who are desperately trying to figure out where the unmute button is get a chance before you just move on. Okay, so um, I get to do the, uh, the presentation this month. Um, I'm Lucy Probst. I'm, I'm your president right now for the Master Gardener Society of Oakland County. Please let me know if anyone's interested in being a president and I can teach you how. Um, the uh, topic for today is growing dahlias in Michigan. And um, I've got 77 slides, a lot of them are picture slides. If they're really crisply in focus, then my wonderful husband Russell took the photo. If they're fuzzy, I probably took the photo. And I'll apologize to you for that. But um, I did make a handout and hopefully you had a chance to uh, pull that handout out so that uh, if I blow past some of these and tell you what flower variety it is, you can circle it on your handout. Um, Growing dahlias in Michigan. How did I get started? Well, it started with Sanders. This is Sanders. Sanders was my dog about 2004. And I started growing some dahlias out of a Home Depot um, dahlia bucket. And, uh, and they were growing and everything looked really great. And um, then one day, as the flowers were starting to be in a big bud and you could see the color coming on, um, the dog ate my flower buds. And that was the time they were about to do the Dahlia show. So I went to the Dahlia show for some advice on what I need to do to keep the dog away from the Dahlia buds. And they said that I should get rid of the dog. So I found out that uh, really, really uh, into it Dahlia people have no pity, pity or, or sympathy for anything that gets in the way uh, in between them and their dahlias. Anyhow, I really loved the show and, uh, and learned and met the people. It was the Southeastern Michigan Dahlia Society. And, uh, and after that, I started growing them to show. Now in 2019, so that's fast forward 15 years, uh, Russell and I took a whole bunch of flowers to the National Dahlia Show, and we had a pretty good, uh, pretty good year. Uh, this was us getting ready to go to the show, and we had our Chevy Traverse full of flowers and the air conditioner on, on Freeze Lucy out of the car in, in August and uh, headed out to the show. This is Russell over here. And... Uh, and so we did that the day of the show and then went to the show itself. Um, this is what, uh, a, this is the National Dahlia Show. You probably won't see as many in a local show. You won't see as many in a local show, but you still see dahlias of this kind of quality. You see this lady here, I don't know her, but these dahlias are as big as her head. I don't, I, I we usually grow some a little bit smaller than the double A size, but uh, Part of the whole Dahlia show is staging the blooms so that they are just perfectly arranged and, and set up so that they kind of look you in the eye. Um, these were the Dahlias we entered into that show. And uh, you can see we've got some with three or four or five blooms into a, into a container or maybe just the singles in here. Um, and uh, for the show, we put in 128 different blooms into the show. And we had a great day. Um, and, 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 and they gave us some spectacular ribbons. The other shows uh, don't necessarily have as, as big a set of ribbons out there, but uh, they've got all kinds of different classifications for dahlias and they show, or, and, and they have the, the best of the best that are called that go on to an honor table at the end of the show. And we managed to get three of our selections on the honor table. This one here is AC uh, Big Johnson. And we had a, a, a trio set and we got the best of the show for that category and a couple of others. So here's the AC Big Johnson. Yeah. And this one is, I think I have to pull this thing a little over here. Sometimes I can't remember which one. This is Alpin Bill. 
And this one's about uh, eight inches across. It's a pretty nice big sized dahlia. And then we've got this little bitty one called valley porcupine and it's only about an inch and a half in diameter. So we go from a, from a 12 inch dahlia down to an inch and a half uh, diameter dahlia. And it's kind of cool because if, if, if you like growing small ones, they've got them. If you like growing the gigantic ones, you can do that too. Um, we've got some, some of the others that made a, a big hit. This was uh, Holly Hill Black Beauty and they call it a water lily type. And I'll show you a little more on that in a little bit. And this one here is a Holly Hill Jeanette. It's an, see, this is my photo, not so sharp. Um, that's very orange. And another AC Big Johnson here. And we'll go through these, I'll get into some more detail. This is supposed to be the teaser on why you wanna grow dahlias because you can see so many different kinds out here. Uh, this one's um, um, Mingus Philip, no, Mingus Wesley. And uh, AC, AC Susie, yeah. And this is Bloomquist Amethyst. You can see that the petals are either rounded at the end or pointy, they call them cactus type. This one is Wildcat. And this one is Clearview Cracker Jack. And I think this one's pretty cool because it kind of has a, a blend of colors from the center of the flower all the way around to the, it's a, it's a ball type dahlia in here. This one is Blight and Softer Gleam. They're about the same size, but they have, this one's kind of backwards from this one. It's got like an orange center and it goes out into the, the, the yellows and, and, and uh, I guess you shouldn't use the word beige. How about cream? Um, Alpin and Bill again, uh, where we did a three of th three. And the thing when you're staging the, uh, the multiple blooms is they're supposed to look exactly the same. I don't know that we really managed to do that with this one. Um, this one's called Tahoma Flare. And uh, Sherry, I know you're on the call. If you've got a Tahoma flare, we, 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 we lost the tuba this year, so you're gonna have to give me one. Um, they also have in the, in the staging, they have where you can enter six or seven or eight of a kind. And uh, that gets a little tricky trying to pick out eight different blooms that are exactly the same level of, of open and angled the same way. And if they're not angled the same way, then you try to figure out well, these two are pretty close and we'll put them here and these are looking a different way and you put them in a different part of the arrangement. Um, this is Bloomquist Butch G. And this is Holly Hill Black Widow. And this one is Bloomquist Sparkle. This one's one of my favorites because down in the deep part of the, the petals, it's kind of got a little bit of, of orangey glow to them. This, this one here uh, is, it was a new one for us a couple of years ago. It's just Bloomquist Luan. And they call it a laciniated type because the ends of the petals look a little like snake's tongues. And that, that makes them fun. Um, where did I do this? Where am I? This, this, this one is American Beauty. So that one's American Dawn. Yeah. Now, um, I'm almost done racing, racing through what we did at the show, but this one's Jessica. A lot of people uh, enjoy that one because it's got this difference between the yellow and the red. And this one is my husband Russell's favorite one. It's called Ketchup and Mustard. I think we mostly like it because of the name, but it does make uh, about 10 inch diameter flowers. Um, Kissy Fitz is only about five inches. And April Dawn here is about eight inches. This one's Wind Sensation. I like this one. Uh, I'm a hottie is about, uh, it's Barbie pink. It is just as pink as you can ever hope to find something. And I like that name, I'm a hottie. Hey, Wilfried. Um, Blackberry Ripple is a variegated type and it's got uh, stripey, stripey, um, petals on it of white and purple. And Itera Rufus is all red, 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 red. It's a great one. Blizzard, Blizzard is kind of a dull, boring uh, flower, but the best part about it is it looks great with all of these other ones in an arrangement. I think it, it's a really good 
foil for the other showy flowers. Alan's Pink Treasure is another one of those laciniated cactus types, the ones that have the little uh, snake tongue petals on them. And Kamano Sitka is, uh, is one of one of my favorites again, because I've got this kind of orangey here with the yellow inside the petals. So, I mean, that's kind of just a quick look over of the, of the kinds of flowers that uh, Russell and I have grown. But I want to get you some, some detail about, so if you're going to do that, how do you get around to doing this? We've, the the uh, dahlias come in from two inches in diameter up to 14 inches, those dinner plate dahlias, the ones that say dinner plate at Home Depot. We want to say, don't go to Home Depot. Come, come, come to our dahlia tuber sales instead. Uh, there are 20 different shapes and forms to them. Uh, you saw many of them, but not all of them. And it seems to be every color in the rainbow except for blue. Um, one of the great things that I think is about dahlias is that they start blooming at the end of July and they go until the hard frost. One year I had them until December 12th. And then, then you know, the 13th hard frost, everything was sad. Um, so we go from these giant show dahlias all the way down to, uh, this is low red eye, and it's the same size as a marigold. So um, depends on what size you want to grow, what, how big a flower do you want to go to. So they have different classifications um, of dahlias where you've got this double A, which is anything over 10 inches in diameter. Uh, a large is an A, which is eight to 10 inches. The medium size is a B, which is six to eight inches. Oh, I, I got names for these two. This is Clyde's Choice. This is Elsie Houston. Elsie likes to grow in bloom. It's a very good starter dahlia. It'll, it'll, it'll take anything. It'll be happy to grow for you. AC Abbey is in our, our uh, grouping for this year. And then this one's called Embrace. It's a, it's a BB, which is uh, only four to six inches in diameter. Wildcat gets smaller. It's called a miniature. It's less than four inches. And um, I, don't, I guess I don't have a ball on this page. Um, palms are the ones that are the smallest ones. Pom poms less than two inches. This one's called Glen Place. What was this one? Wildcat. So there's all kinds of different shapes to them and different sizes that go with them. And uh, we do have a secret formula for growing dahlias. Put on soil amendments, compost, uh, composted uh, cow or sheep manure, one of the, the uh, most heralded uh, dahlia growers that, uh, that we've had was um, he, he, he had a sheep farm and he used composted sheep manure on all of his. They want full sun. If, um, if you have shade, they're gonna get tall and leggy. When I say full sun, it's like dawn to dusk. Um, it, um, yeah. I'll show you what happens when you don't have full sun and water them. They need to always have some water going. So you have to figure out what kinds of varieties you wanna plant. Some grow very tall. Um, kids climax will grow very tall and some will always remain small like that one that's the size of a, of a marigold a low red eye or this minion single HS wink could stay small it, and it depends on how you work with it and the best thing to do is talk with some Dahlia Society members because they're going to be your best resources of which ones are going to be big and which ones are going to be small and just so you know, um, there are the, these Dahlia Societies have tuber sales. Um, you guys may have heard of Dahlia Hill, that's up in Midland. And uh, on the last two Saturdays in May, they have a tuber sale um, in, in the morning and it's held in the workroom in Midland. And they have some really low cost, because they grow so many um, low cost Dahlias. The, the group I'm affiliated with, the Southeastern Michigan Dahlia Society, is having our tuber sale on May 1st. And it's going to be held at Telly's Greenhouse in the barn. Uh, Telly's Greenhouse is at uh, 16 and John R., about a quarter mile north of 
16 slash big beaver. And I think we're selling them for around $4 each. Um, so you can, we'll have it posted on the SCMDS website uh, of details about it or on our Facebook page. But that's Saturday, May 1st, just a couple of weeks from now. So it is important to plan what you're gonna do with your Dahlia garden. And you can grow them, so you, you, know, you can grow them in a border if you've got border dahlias, and that's what I've got here at the front of my uh, front yard. I've got a little row of dahlias and then other stuff behind it. Or you can, um, or you can grow them in containers or a really big pot. Um, and, and these border dahlias you can buy by the flat. They're about 30 bucks a flat. Or what I, you do it one time and then you can, you can dig up the tubers in the fall and then you never have to buy another flat of border dahlias again. Or you can intermingle them with other plants in your garden. This one here is Lulu Island Mom. And now every one of these uh, stakes in here is another dahlia we've got growing in our yard around, around, along with our hydrangeas and roses and clematis. So you can do that. Or you can set it up as more of a, a cutting garden where, um, where it's only dahlias in that area rather than, than mixing it, intermingling it with what's going on in your garden. This is uh, our member Sherry Miller's uh, garden area. And what she's done is making sure that there's room for the plants to grow and room to get to them because they do take some fiddling and futzing around with to get those kinds of sizes if that's what you're, you're into. So this is... Um, this is in the back or in, in my backyard. And again, where we've got all these posts, it, it's, it's a little pre-dahlia time. It's still there growing. And so if that's a four foot fence, this plant is already six feet to seven feet tall. Now, if I had treated them properly and, and pinched off and disbudded at the appropriate time, they probably wouldn't be quite so tall. These are some values back in here. So um, this is what uh, we do in our backyard, but to really, Okay, wait, selecting. Lucy, you uh, are muted. How? How did I get muted? Okay. I didn't do it. All right. Um, so if you don't have that eight to 10 hours of sunlight, they're gonna start getting taller and taller just reaching for the sun, which may work for you if that's how you wanna do it. These are, these are just to, to grow in the yard, but they're really not uh, growing in a manner that's, that's ready to do kinds of shows. Um, they will grow pretty well in almost any soil. Um, they, don't, they like well-drained soil. They don't wanna get rotted. And the, as I said, the le not enough sun leads to some lanky plants and not as many blooms. So I'm gonna throw a few dahlia pictures in here while we talk about stuff. They've got different shapes. This one's a novelty format or, or uh, look to the dahlia. Where's that one? And this one, they call it an orchid type where it's just the eight petals. Some of them are, are curled up like this and Marie Schnug. So um, they need the full sun, well-drained soil. They're considered tender perennials in Michigan. Um, so they required to be dug up and, and the tubers stored over the winter. Now you could, um, channel, channeling my um, Carol Lenchek, you could treat them as annuals and, and support the green industry and buy new ones every year. Um, any dahlia that's going to be on, uh, over three feet tall, it needs staking. They can't hold themselves up. So that's part of the work in the dahlia business is to make sure you stake the plants. And the low growing varieties can be used in a, in a front border. So how do you, how do you, what's the easy way? Easy way is you buy some tubers, you wait until after the last frost and um, plant them about the same time you'd plant a tomato. The ground needs to be at least 50 degrees. So if you've got a, uh, a garden thermometer, 
you know, poke it in there when, when the ground reaches 50 degrees, you can throw your tubers in. Put them in about five inches deep with the eye up and cover it up. Put in the stake right now, even though there's nothing there to see and you've got this five foot stake sitting in your garden and, and uh, it looks a little intimidating for those little tiny plants. But you don't want to be putting the stake in after it starts to grow because now you don't know where the tuber is and you don't want to skewer it. Um, once you start to see growth is when you start watering it and every week make sure you're giving it some water. So that's, if that's all you want to do, that's the easy way. Now, um, no, staking it, different ways people stake or, or do it. You, we've got some here with some, some bamboo uh, with some um, strings in here crisscrossing that keep everything from flopping over. Got some people with some upside down tomato cages, um, wooden wooden stakes ready to uh, waiting for the dahlias. This uh, Russell and I rent a couple of plots out in the toll gate uh, community garden area, and this is our uh, garden area ready to go. So we've actually got some half inch conduit or uh, uh, aluminum conduit that's that's. Uh, uh, what is this? You know, pounded into the so, uh, the ground when we're ready to. So the stakes are there before we ever plant. So everybody, many people have different ways of doing their staking. Uh, just so long as you do stake, I don't care how you do it. Um, now the flowers are great in arrangements. So here's some different uh, types that we have. We've got a ball type, which is anything over three and a half inches, where the petals go all the way and recurve back to the, um, to the stem. And a miniature ball type, uh, Sir Richard here is two to three and a half inches. And then the palms are also ball shaped, but they're the small ones, uh, less than two inches. Boom, quiz, Doug C here. So they look the same, it's just a different category because of the size. Okay, let's see. So how do, how do, how do we do it in, in our family out at the Tollgate Farm? Well, it all starts at the end of the, the last season. And um, this is kind of the, the mess that it looks like. And Russell's already uh, gotten the cow manure and some peat moss ready to go down. We pull back the, the fabric that we have and lay that out and, um, and then rake it in, stir it up before we even, uh, before the fall is over. And uh, we've done peat moss, composted manure, and, and coffee grounds. Great place for coffee grounds is Starbucks. You take them a five gallon bucket and they'll fill it up in about 20 minutes. So if you take them a few five gallon buckets and rotate and get it every day, you'll have all the coffee grounds you could ever think you ever wanted. Um, cultivate it in um, long, long rake or, uh, but we don't um, till, not at this time anyway. So this is, uh, what it, what it looks like when, when we're done stirring it up. Oh, here's another one. This one's called a, a water lily type. It's called Pam Howden. And it does kind of look like a, a water lily other than the floating in water part of it. And this type here is another laciniated cactus with those, those uh, snake tongues in here. And uh, hissy fits is a BB type. So it's like six to eight inches in diameter. Yeah. So um, in the springtime, while we're waiting for planting time, we uh, make sure that the ground cover uh, is, is over it, We've got wood chips going down in between the aisles for the walking spaces, get the uh, stakes pounded into the ground, and then um, something that's one of, the, one of our success points is we actually put in drip irrigation where, there's actually, where there is a drip spout at every single plant. So we're only watering the plants that we want to grow. It's not an overhead uh, watering operation. We're not watering the weeds. Um, and we use a stuff from a company called Dripworks. If you're interested in doing that, they've got a, a really good website. Uh, they can talk you through a whole lot of the details about it. You'll need a, a pressure reducer. You'll need a timer. Uh, the hoses and the drip emitter, emitters. But uh, once you get that set up, 
then you set the clock and uh, and the watering happens without you having to be there every day with a hose. You do have to watch and make sure, you know, if you've got a lot of rain happening, you don't want also the, uh, the, the watering to happen. So you got to still pay attention to the weather and take out uh, or turn off the, the uh, drip irrigation when it's really wet outside. So this is, this is what our, our living room looked like a couple of weeks ago. And so all of these tubers were stored in uh, over, over the winter and stored in our crawl space. And we, we store them in Ziploc bags that have, uh, have been um, punctured with uh, a paper tiger like you do for wallpaper, just to make sure that there is some breathing going on with the, with the, um, with the bags. And always, always, always label everything because the moment you think that you remember what kind it was, you know, the dog runs through the room, the kids run through the room, everything gets stirred up and, and, and your life is over. So you have to keep them straight and keep them, keep them together. Okay, so Encore is a laciniated cactus type. I think I really like those. And then this one here looks like a shuttlecock from badminton, but uh, it's called an anemone. And this one's called Platinum Blonde. I think that's pretty cool looking. I'd like to grow that one. Anybody have it? Um, and what is it that you're planting? So these are called tubers, just like potatoes. And just like potatoes, they're not going to grow unless they have an eye. And the eye shows up on the crown or kind of where the plant came out of the ground in the first place. You're never going to find eyes on the body of the tuber, only at the, at the top end up here. So these are very visible eyes here. This is where the plants are going to grow. They develop on the old crown. And, it, and, and the tuber itself provides energy for those first couple of weeks that the plant starts growing. This is what it looks like in our basement. And so we've got um, tables to put stuff on. And we've got grow lights. Um, I forget which kind. They're grow lights. Um, the other thing that we have is an uh, oscillating fan. That we have that we run over here and and for some brand new ones or maybe cuttings we have a heat mat that we met that we use underneath them to make sure everything's warmed and started so when you one of the things that we do is we've got uh, these quart sized deli containers from gordon food service and drill holes down in it in the bottom to for, for drainage we use just a potting potting mix, a soilless potting uh, mix. And you can see we don't even bury the tuber all of the way on these starters that we have. Um, again, we're going to label it. Always make sure you label it. He's actually burned holes through there so that you can get the tag to stay on it and they don't accidentally fall off. A, a benefit that we've got on using these clear plastic deli containers is if you don't, if, if there's no green showing, but you still you can still see that something's happening. You've got some roots going on. You can be you can be um, encouraged that that something's growing in there, and it'll be grow, uh, the plants you'll see at any minute now. So um, we've got the grow lights up here. This is a whole bunch of plants that are that are happening. Oh, segue extra extra photos. This one's called, uh, this is a cactus type. So these, these uh, petals all grow out kind of pointy looking. Uh -huh. And this one's called Western Spanish Dancer. And then this one's called Holly Hill, cactus, Holly Hill Cotton Candy. And I think that's a pretty appropriate name um, because it does look like what happened and what, what just got handed to you out of the state fair. Um, this one's called an incurved cactus type. All right, so a couple, more, a few more days have happened while we looked at those two flowers. And uh, you, these, you can see the roots are growing in here. And uh, once you see green is when you can start watering. So you don't want to water these ones over here. They're not, they're not showing growth yet, but you want to make sure you stay ahead and, and, and keep up with that. And back behind here, we've got that oscillating fan that's that's blowing on the tubers so that it can start growing some, um, some more sturdy stems. 
Now, if you only have one tuber and you wanted to grow two or three plants, uh, we've actually done some cuttings. It's new to us, but uh, it's been done by Dahlia people for a long, long time. And as these plants get bigger, like these here, maybe that one is too big, but you can, you can do a cutting on them where you cut the shoots at about a 45 degree angle, you dip them into a growth hormone, and then you can put them in the, the solo cups in your soilless potting mix, and then put a plastic cup on top of it. Um, these things, since they have no roots, they're really delicate. And, uh, and so you need to have that little greenhouse for it all on its own. And after a week, a week or so, you can tilt the cup a little bit to let a little moisture out. But you gotta watch that, that plant that's in there so that uh, you gotta make sure it doesn't wilt. If it starts to fall over or wilt, put the cup back on top. Uh, once uh, the, the roots take hold and it doesn't, uh, doesn't wilt when you tilt or remove the cup, then you're, you're ready to get going and you'll be able to plant the plant in a, in a few weeks. So here we are. Like I said, it's after, after risk of all, hard fro or, or all frost, about the time you plant the tomatoes. We want the ground to be about 60 degrees. Maybe I said 50 earlier, 50s. Maybe okay, 60s better. Um, make sure you have the stakes in the ground, have your water situation set up, and now let's get ready to plant these things. So this is this is kind of the crawl along the ground um, planting kit that we've got. We've got our gloves and, and some scissors and spades. Um, one of the things we do use is sluggo to make sure to help deter slugs. They do like to eat a brand new tender dahlia plant. So uh, sluggo helps keep the keep them away. In the bottom of the hole, we put in a quarter cup or so of osmocote. And um, I found and we found that using a kneeler makes our lives better. We'd like to like to uh, show that this is a West Marine uh, personal flotation device and it costs about half what the fancy uh, garden stores call for those little, little little one inch foam kneelers that they have. And it's bigger and it's easier to carry around, it even has a nice little handle. So I think you should all go out to West Marine or some boat store and buy yourself some, some boat PFDs to use as your kneelers. They last, uh, we, we never have to replace them. So, and, and they're big enough, you don't lose them. Um, and then the other thing we, We've got there the little drip emitters. They must be in the bucket here somewhere, so that uh, it will dole out the water at two gallons an hour or something. So this this oh and this bucket here is when you dig the hole and you have extra soil because there was already soil in the little cups. You can use this to keep everything tidy. The scissors are to cut holes, criss whoops, crisscross the holes here, um, and then tuck the tuck the material back and then you can plant the plant in here and it helps uh, keep all the weeds at bay. I don't, we don't like to weed. We'd much rather just deal with the flowers. Oh, look at these flowers. Here we are again. The ketchup and mustard, like I said, it's one of our, our family favorites. And uh, this is like an eight to 10 inch flower here. And then this one's my daughter's favorite. It's called Poo. Uh, and she just made, she thought it was like Winnie the Pooh, and so she always wants us to have a Pooh in the garden. Called the Collaret type. And that one's about three inches in diameter. So this is what our garden looks like once things get planted. And I want to point out that we, we put the labels up high on the poles. Um, and and um, because it, it helps because other a lot of people put the tags down real low and then you're spending all summer bending way down to try to remember what that flower is and these are more at eye level here and Russell's actually drilled holes through the uh, through the uh, aluminum conduit so that we can put the twisty ties just right straight through the uh, through the pole and uh, well, see see there's a little hole with a twisty tie through it. So last year we, we had an interesting year where we weren't able to make it out to a toll gate because of the whole lockdown. We were finally able to plant uh, almost the end of June. So we planted some 
that were our starter plants. And then, and then we gave away a lot of our plants and then we had empty spaces in the garden. So we direct sowed tubers right into the ground at the same time we were planting plants. So now I guess this is about a month later, but this is the difference between the head start started in the basement and the ones planted directly in the ground. So that's why I, why I suggest that you uh, make sure that you are moving in transplants rather than direct sowing into the ground. All right, so what do you do to keep the dahlias from, from growing taller than your garage? Oh, I always get to say this again. Put the stakes in when you plant it. Um, put, the, put it two feet into the ground and um, about a foot shorter than how high you think the plant's gonna go and tie it to the stakes as they grow. So you tie it when it's five inches tall and keep going as it grows taller. And they keep growing taller and taller and taller until you break off their apical meristem which you learned about in Master Gardener class. And what happens when you, when you uh, pinch off that leader is that it starts to encourage lateral growth. And every time you do that, you're gonna get two more branches. And then you can, you can snip off those and those will make branches. And uh, that way you're gonna get more blooms out of the whole thing. You're also controlling how tall the plant's gonna be getting. And so when people say, how tall is that dowie plant gonna be? It's like, well, if you do the pinching and the, and the disbudding and the disbranching, according to how you see stuff in, in the semds.org and our um, YouTube channel, then um, you'll be able to control the height of the plant. Uh, and if you're really diligent, you really can control the height of the plant. Sometimes I'm left just to myself, we, we lose control. Russell does a much better job. Okay, so here we are back out at uh, Tollgate Farm and just wanted to show you, so we, um, this, you know, you plant it and you look at it going, I think I could put about 60 more plants in here, but this is what happens. We plant them about two and a half feet apart and uh, two and a half months later, the garden is full. Well, we've still got the um, wood chip pathways and this is the uh, area between them but uh, they're gonna grow just, uh, you already know that, but don't be um, tempted to make them too tight because if they don't have air and enough room for stuff to, to um, enough room for the air to flow through, you could get powdery mildew um, and nobody ever likes that. Uh, here's a couple more examples of flowers. Orchid, uh, or orchid type here is called Midnight Star, and this is one of the darker ones that we've got out here. Um, this one is a collarette type called Alpen Diamond, and it's a collarette because it's got these little funky little petals in here. And this is only about two and a half inches in diameter. And this tiny little one called is a peony type, and they think it looks like a peony, I guess, Elvira. Um, and it seems to me that the smaller ones make many, many more flowers than the gargantuan ones. So you have to kind of make your choice. You know, you want lots and lots and lots and lots of flowers or you want a few monster flowers. So this is how I spend all my summer hours where you're in there and you're picking off little extra buds or snipping off branches as we go. And uh, this is what we're trying to do. We call it disbudding. And we disbud so that you don't have messy looking flowers. This is what happens when you don't disbud. And what, what, ha what you wanna do is they always grow in threes, almost always. And what you gotta do is take off the outer two buds so that the middle one, the main flower will grow to its fullest potential. You also wanna take off a couple of the, the leaves below it so that you'll have a long enough stem so that it'll look pretty in a vase. Um, if you don't take off the leaves, then the flower looks crowded. If you don't take off these buds, then you've got buds growing through your flowers. Um, and so there's a lot of fiddling and farting and futzing around with these dahlias like this, where you just sit, stand there and pick off a few and pick off a few and you keep moving. And, uh, but the payoff are the big pretty flowers at the end. 
Um, I think they make great cut flowers. Uh, they only last five, seven days at the most. It's almost like three to three to five days. Um, when the if if you didn't cut them off and they and they deadhead in your garden, cut off those deadheaded ones and it will encourage some reblooming. As long as you keep up and keep cutting off the dead ones, uh, you'll get more and more flowers. And you know, I'm not a great flower arranger, but if you've got great flowers, they'll they, they'll they'll put uh, any of your arrangements uh, can happen. Oh, look, here's some more tubers. Except those are potato tubers. Um, so you can you can arrange them so they're very very tall arrangements. You can make them so that they sprawl everywhere. You can just say keep giving me flowers until I can't fit any more in there. Um, but uh, and here I've got it mixed in with some of the roses we've got out of our yard. And so um, they just look great in the, in the arrangements. Oh, they don't have any smell. There's no aroma to them. They're, they're all for the pretty, okay? So um, that's, that's how I know when somebody's new to Dahlia Amos. They'll put their face in it and go, huh, all right. And this is the saddest day in the garden. This is um, the day before it was a beautiful, perfect garden. And then the hard frost comes overnight. And this is how you know it's done. It goes from a beautiful blooming garden to, to, to sad black leaves in 12 hours. So, but you're gonna, I mean, you can see we were still having lots and lots of blooms happening till the hard frost. So this is how we do, um, this is uh, what we do at the end of the season. So the thing you get to do is you got to cut them off about six inches um, at the top and just pile them up and haul them off. Um, you can see these stems that we're leaving. That helps us find them later. And you can leave them in the ground for a week afterwards and it'll encourage the plant to start eyeing up so you can see where the next season's plants will grow out. And then it's time to dig up about a week week after you uh, cut them off if you want to allow some of the eyeing up to start. And when you start to dig them, you've got to dig a really big diameter around there. We've pulled back the, uh, the ground cover and uh, got uh, this garden fork in here and all the way around. So this is almost a foot and a half of diameter, maybe even a little more of all of the new tubers that have grown over the summertime. So you gotta give a really wide circle around the stem and uh, otherwise you're gonna put the fork or your, or your shovel straight through a couple of the tubers and then you'll, you'll be sad. Um, this, is, this is Russell and our, our friend Bob Barner um, where we, we'd had enough for a while. These were the last blooms before, uh, before we whacked everything off and uh, and, and Bob has helped us learn more about dahlias than, than anyone. Um, so he's a, he's a great resource. So this is what we do after we've dug these up. They're, they're in a great, or here's, here's some that aren't dug up yet. But this is Russell in his, his rubber boots and a rubber apron and rubber gloves and a hose. And we actually, we've got a screen here over um, sawhorses. And um, we do it right over the garden soil because we got to get all the all the soil, all the dirt off of these things before we start getting ready to put it away. And we found that if you just spray them off right over your garden, you can have your soil back. And it's a messy operation, which is how we learned that we need to have uh, we need to have the rubber 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 suit on to get this here. So we spray off the soil and you need to let it dry for at least 24 hours afterwards. And don't put them down on the cement. The cement will just suck the moisture out of it to, uh, excessively, it'll ruin them. So you can put them on uh, some cardboard or leave them on a rack or something like that. But uh, please try not, don't put it on cement, you'll regret it. And then at the, um, you, can, you can store the dry tubers in clumps and, and divide them up in the spring, or you can, you can divide them up at, uh, in the fall. You have to have this eye on the tuber um, 
to make sure that it's going to grow. And so you got to be careful where you're cutting these apart. You can cut it apart going here or, or here. And, uh, and then store them in your, in your container. Now, there are as many storage techniques or, as there are people who have ever grown dahlias. And uh, many, many, many of them are discussed in, in various websites. But you want to store them to be, be between 40 and 50 degrees, keep them in the dark. And um, to help avoid rotting, you should not let them touch each other during storage. Yeah. This one is storing them in some peat moss. You can store them in vermiculite or sand, peat moss. You can store them in between sheets of newspaper. You can store them in these Ziploc bags that have had the, uh, the holes put in them using that paper tiger. And everyone has an opinion. Um, oh, here, we've also got people who will roll them in saran wrap. They're, they're actually individually wrapped, but then they're kind of grouped up here and here. Um, or, as I said, channeling Carol and check, you can leave them in the ground and buy a whole new batch next spring. So, um, resources, places you can go, and that's part of the, the handout that I gave is um, some information on resources. Um, we've got the Southeastern Michigan Dahlia Society, which is at semds.org, and we've got a YouTube channel. And those links are on the handout. Uh, the Michigan Dahlia Association is kind of more Ann Arbor saline area, but uh, they're a great resource. And most of the people in SEMDS are also members of the Michigan Dahlia Society and back and forth. And then the American Dahlia Society is the, the owner group for, for the United States. And they've got some great resources on dahlia.org for finding names of dahlias that are in this size or this shape or the color that you want. So in that classification guide in the no section, you can look up different kinds of dahlias that you want to grow. So this is, this is a, a picture for semds.org, Southeastern Michigan Dahlia Society. And uh, we'd love to have you. If you want to do a road trip one day, you can go out to that Dahlia Hill, which is pretty cool. It's free. All you have to do is get there. They do have some parking out there, um, but there are no restrooms, so be prepared. And the best time to go is um, probably August through October. They're a little further north, so they start a little later and end a little sooner. But uh, it, it's a fun little trip out there to Dahlia Hill in Midland. Uh, this is the guy who started Dahlia Hill. He, he started, it's Charles Breed, and he started it in 1966. And uh, he, he liked growing tubers. And then he met up, worked with a guy called Bill Fisher, and he owned the property where Dahlia Hill is now. And between uh, Bill and Charles, they planted 1,700 tubers. And uh, that, that was the start of Dahlia Hill. They now have a, a, an art studio. I forget who was the artist. But you can see they've, they've got four different sculptures out there. And it's supposed to be spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And this one is either autumn or winter. It kind of looks a little droopy. Um, and in 1998, they started that Dahlia Hill Society. And they now terraced this garden. And they've got their cast iron. Oh, Charles Breed did this the uh, cast iron sculptures. This is an aerial view of what Dahlia Hill looks like. So you park over here underneath the willow trees and you can walk your way up to it. And they actually over here have a memorial garden and uh, I don't remember what they call it, but you can have your cremains interred here and always be remembered for dahlias if that's uh, in your desire. So um, that's what these two circles are up here. And you can just walk through these gardens. And they've got them all labeled. And then you go away from there with a great big list of things. And, and uh, maybe you'll go to the, uh, the, the tuber sale they have the following spring. Here's another view of what's going on in here. They're, they're um, you know, maybe that spring and summer and, and the other two sculptures out there at Dahlia Hill. 
There's, a, there's another picture of down the hill and of a morning fogginess when we got there. So I encourage everybody to, if you, if you just want to learn more, um, you can go to a show. And the shows are pretty cool. Um, and um, some of them have arrangements uh, as part of their, their show um, entry types. Um, this, was, this was us right before we left for the, for the show. Um, it was out at, um, where was it? The, 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 in Grand Rapids, the place in Grand Rapids. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, Meyer Gardens. And, and the show, the 2019 national show was at Meyer Gardens. And they rotate the shows around and uh, the West Coast, Seattle and uh, Oregon and, and Washington State do a lot of downy growing. And they do uh, shows out in New York and South Carolina. And um, let's see here. We've got our local shows. And this is also in the handout. We got the local shows on Labor Day weekend out in Washtenaw Community College. And then uh, the Southeastern Michigan Society is having their show on September 17th through the 19th at Orchard Mall. And the National Dahlia Show this year is going to be in Wooster, Ohio, uh, the weekend of September 9th through the 12th. So that's the place to go to see the national show and the, and the, and the most dahlias. And as I said, they rotated around, but this will be the closest it's gonna be for a long time. So all of those are put into the handout so you can reference it and come to see one of the shows. And we're gonna be working, uh, we're planning on showing, Russell and I are planning on showing at our, our and defending our national championship title. So, um, I just want to thank you for your attention today. And if you've got any questions, maybe I can answer them for you. But uh, this is what I've put together for you today. Hope I've been, made you want to grow a dahlia. We did have a, a few questions come through um, on chat. Um, the first one was, okay. why do you cover the soil while you're waiting to plant? And what is that cover made of, like before planting? Um, I don't know. Let me see if I can find it. We're almost there. <laughs> this one here, while we're waiting to plant, this was just preparing the garden bed to make it so that uh, we're most uh, so that uh, we're ready at the, at the time when the ground is at the right temperature. And so we've got in there the soil amendments with the peat moss and composted cow manure, the cough grounds, and then we put the ground cover over it and weeds out. to keep the weeds out. Warms it up faster in the spring. Oh yeah, Russell says, and the ground cover, if you're using this black ground cover, will warm it up a little faster too, so maybe you can plant sooner. But that's, that's what we're doing is, we get this all ready, we put the stakes in the ground and we do the, and, and get ready to do the planting. Is that the, did I answer the question? Yeah, and they're wondering too, like, what is it made out of? Is it like a plastic? Oh, what is it made out of? It's a heavy duty plastic. And it's a heavy duty um, commercial, quality commercial quality ground cover. Um, some of them you can buy and they actually have yellow lines on them. And this is from a couple of years ago, but the ones we have now have yellow lines in them, so we get like dead ass straight rows. And um, I can't say that. I'm sorry. Um, so that uh, you can do that, but it's don't go get the cheap, cheap, cheap uh, uh, ground fabric because it doesn't last. And if you get some sturdier stuff, you can use it year after year. Well, for three seasons anyway. And somebody also asked about the sluggo. Um, they were told that it kills earthworms. Do you know if that has any truth to it or? Well, this is, this, is, this is actually permeable. The water can go through. So it's not just plastic, it's a fabric. So it, uh, water can get through. And when we're digging them up, there are worms all over the place. So I don't think we're killing any worms using this. They probably, yeah, this, because it's This warm. person was asking about the sluggo you suggested using oh. in the later slide. I don't know if 
we're mostly worried about the slugs earlier, early in the season, but while the plants are really getting started, we've only used it at the very beginning of the season at the top of the, at the top of the, um, yeah, once they're planted um, on, the, on the top of the soil. Um, maybe, maybe it's not good for, for worms. I don't know. Oh, one of the things I'm supposed to say is always, 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 always follow the label instructions on any um, pesticide or amendment that you're putting or purchased amendment you're putting on your, on your soil or on your plants. More is not better. So Lucy, I saw the note. It says sluggo kills earthworms. I have found that not to be true. Okay, that's Sherry Neller, one of our team, uh, one of our members from the southeastern Michigan Valley. Sorry, and Russell got me on the sluggo plus, and it's great. Yeah. And then um, our next question we had: um, What variety would you suggest for a shorter border? Um. If, if you go to um, a garden store, um, they'll, they'll call it a border dahlia. And the stuff, I mean, I really just went down to Eastern Market of about four years ago and bought one flat and um, have been growing more and more and more every year, just digging them up and dividing the tubers and planting more in the next year and the next year. You, you have one plant, you come back depending on how well the plant does with five to 20 tubers out of that one plant at the end of the season. But you need to look for, for one called a border dahlia because unless it says border, uh, it's gonna be one that gets three to six feet tall. And, and that's even when you're doing the, uh, the pinching off uh, to, to stop the vertical growth. But I don't, oh, well, I do have a couple of varieties. They're a little bigger than border. The Kelsey Dwarf and uh, Low Red Eye grow the size of marigolds. You know, if that's a border, then that's a border. Um, there are probably others, but those are the two that come to mind right now. Okay. And then I think it kind of got answered, but um, somebody was asking when to start indoors and if you, moisten your potting mix? Yeah, so you do want to get the potting mix so that it is moist, not soggy. You know, still you want it to be crumbly. You don't want it to be uh, sodden. And, um, and it's a soilless mix. Wait, you said something else. What else did you say? Right? I can't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's this soilless stuff, you know, with the perlite in it and all of that. Oh, you said when? When, yeah. We planted ours the first week of April. We may still have uh, led the season a little bit. First or second week of April started indoors so that you've got about six weeks of, of pre-growing before you put them into the ground after the last, or after the last frost and you've got 50 to 60 degree soil outside. But don't be afraid to do it on May 1st after you've come to our tuber sale. <laughs> because right? Yes, because absolutely. Three to four week head start. So that's all. Yeah, yeah head start's a head start and it helps you have the bigger, uh, you know, you, 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 get, you get into the blooming earlier, which is good. <laughs> We had somebody who asked um, that they have some started plants in pots outside right now. Um, at what point, what cold temp will hurt them? Um, if, if we've got a frost, if, if it looks like there's a frost coming, you're going to want to cover that up, especially if you've got some green on there. Uh, the problem right now of putting the tubers right into the ground is that there's a possibility for rot because the ground gets pretty cold. It's pretty wet and it doesn't drain away if uh, a lot of stuff even below it is still wet. Well, here's our ground cover with a, with a stripy line on it. And um, Julie wants to know if she can go out to Tollgate and see your garden. Um, last year, and so far this year, only people who are certified as volunteers through the Master Gardener 
MSU's sign off and volunteer stuff. So I guess every one of you, because you've already recertified, right? All of you can come out. Um, and if, and everybody knows where the dahlias are. So if you get out there um, and you're looking for the dahlias, just see anybody who's out there, but you, you, you pull in and keep heading, which, which direction? Heading east, he says. Okay. Behind the pig barn. Behind the pig barn. <laughs> so we had another question. Um, are border dahlias the same as patio dahlias? Probably. Yeah. And then also for some potting mix that has fertilizer in it, would adding Osmocote to that, would that be too much fertilizer for a dahlia? I don't know. I it's probably okay, but I, I don't know. I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. Okay. And then somebody also asked, what kind of roping or wire do you use with your pole support? Biodegradable twine. Uh, a biodegradable twine is what we use to, to tie stuff up with. Um, some people are, there's, there's other stuff that's out there at the uh, English Gardens or Home Depot or other places, but we, we just use some twine. And then if anybody else had any... <laughs> Russell says a lot of twine. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of twine, I bet. Um, if anybody else had any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or use the chat function to ask. Um, and uh, we can get to your questions real quick. Oh, you always have such beautiful dahlias, Lucy. It's nice to know some of your, your methods. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, so we do have a lot of... Uh, YouTube channel. Open something up on another screen here. I'll drag it over to the screen. And Excuse me, Amanda. Yeah. Okay. This is Deanne. Uh, I didn't receive, and other people have said they didn't receive a handout. Would that be sent out later, please? Um, yeah, we can. So you go to go to our our website. I just posted it on in the yeah. chat room. It went, it, it went by so fast. I'm sorry. It's I in the chat room. It's right here. Right here. It's oh, right oh, up the handout. Thank so you. The, yeah. And and so that one will have the links so that you can get to these YouTube videos that can um, we've got the season of growing dahlias is really a great place and a great great thing to do. To, to go through one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six of them. You don't have to watch them all at once. This is the beginning of the year and the, and the planting and getting ready and putting it in the ground and disbudding um, in here and uh, disbranching and then the harvesting and storage. So, so these are great resources when you want to get into more details. But the, the fun thing is enjoy the flowers, come to come to a show, come to one of the uh, one of the meetings of the mass of the uh, Southeastern. Southeastern Michigan Dahlia Society. Open their website here if I can get it to work. And um, and and we'd love to have you. It's it's like everything else. I mean, you got the you've got the lily people and the rose people and the iris people and I'm one of the dahlia people. It's, it's what do you have a chance and what can you learn? How can you get to it? So, um, you know, there are people out there. If you want to be one of those people, we'd love to have you. Then we had another question that just came through. Um, any recommendations on how to deal with Japanese beetles? Japanese beetles, any recommendations? Russell, Russell is a proponent of, of uh, non-organic kill anything things. Now, one of the things, you know, because I know we got a lot of organic people and, and that might be real rep or repugnant to you is the dahlias and except for the orchid type and the singles, um, it's, uh, when, you, when, um, when you cut them, they're still tight. You're not seeing the center of the flower and the bees aren't either. So if you're only growing the type that have the tight centers before they blow out, um, you're, you're affecting fewer bees. Um, and it's the ones where they have the open centers on them that uh, you'd have to worry about that. But 
uh, Russell likes seven. He uses bear, bear type of thing. We've got issues with aphids, spider mites, and uh, the dune, dune beetles, Japanese beetles are all pests for dahlias. And then the um, powdery mildew, if you've got them planted in there too tight and they don't have room for the air to flow. So they'll grow. If you want them to grow and be spectacular, you've got to, you've really got to work to, to futz around with them. Or you get the ones that I had at the very beginning of the, of the presentation. In, in my, uh, in my early on. And did anybody else have any more questions? Or any comments? Feel free to unmute yourself at this point or use a chat. Lucy, this was so great to watch. It really is inspiring. Okay. I was, I was worried I was either boring or overwhelming. So um, thank you. No, it looks like a fantasy. I want to come look at your garden. <laughs> Well, you're welcome to come over. Uh, there's not, they won't be blooming until the end of July, so. <laughs> well, I'll hold off then. <laughs> Lucy, well, thank you so much for the information. It was very helpful. Good, I'm glad. Great I was job, gonna, Lucy. I was going to say great job, Lucy, and I blame you for my addiction, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I take full credit for anybody who, who <laughs> gets into it after 2004. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, do, yeah. do you know if deer eat dahlias? Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> Everything but daffodils, I think. And they eat daffodils in a, in a lean year, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if my dog will eat a bud, and it, and it was the only year he ever did. I kept the dog until, until he passed away on his own, okay? Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure the bunnies, bunnies like them at the, at early on. So you kind of want to maybe put a, a little cardboard border around it until they, they get started pretty well. Maybe. Sometimes we've had a bunny issue, but not usually. Um, the, the toll gate, the garden area has an eight, um, eight or 10 foot deer fence around the entire area with a um, fence, um, two inch squares, pretty heavy gauge fencing that's two feet down into the ground. They've got an electrified wire around the top of it. And all of that keeps out the groundhogs and the bunnies and the deer. So it's a wonderful place to, if you wanna, if you, if, uh, you have a tiny yard and you want to grow all sun kinds of things like uh, vegetables and downies. Do, does anything bother them like once they get growing? Is it mainly when they're young that you have to worry about? It's, it's mainly you're, you're going to get the, the, the mammal type critters uh, early on in the slugs. After, after they get established, uh, it doesn't seem to bother them. That's when the, that's when the June bugs and the, and the aphids and the spider mites. The smaller pests <laughs> come in. The to smaller you. ones come to get you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, and earwigs. They're so disgusting. Does, does anybody like an earwig? They like to sit inside the white ones. Russell calls the white ones sacrificial victims. He plants white ones near his red ones so they don't eat his red ones. <laughs> they, they have a color choice? <laughs> I got, they seem to. Oh, yeah. Japanese beetles love the white flowers and earwigs, but yeah, so make sure you kind of shake it out before you bring it inside, unless you like all the things on the counter. Yes. So if you have like a a bicolor one that's like red and white. Well, I don't. Ear, earwigs you know. then, or? <laughs> I would say they all get earwigs. Oh gosh. I know. Well, thank you so much for presenting for us, Lucy. It was very. All right. And your dahlias are always so beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, we've, we've kept you 10 minutes over, so hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, 
you get to have an hour and um, 15 hour and 15 minutes of education credit there you go yeah. <laughs> five hours on saturday only three and a half hours to go yeah okay. we got plenty of more meetings if anybody wants to <laughs> all right thank you all and have a great night Thanks, well, thank you. thanks, Amanda, for setting this up for us. No problem. Thanks, Have a good night. Thanks for thanks, setting Lucy. Up. Thanks. You guys. <laughs>